so Rit, for um, accepting our invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, so Surit is an associate professor at uh, MIT. He has very interesting uh, research at the intersection of optimization and machine learning. Uh, but he is also beyond these areas. He has also, you know, produced uh, in differential geometry, matrix analysis, uh, and other um, other fields. And uh, he is the founder of the Optimization for Machine Learning Seminars, uh, which is really my favorite part in the NeurIPS uh, conferences. And more recently, he has also founded uh, a startup uh, called um, uh, uh, called Micro Eyes. Uh, you know, he's uh, in, uh, in different uh, uh, games, uh, both industry and academia. And um, it's with that, it's our pleasure to have uh, Surit uh, as a speaker. Thanks, thanks, Word and uh, Wahid for uh, the invitation and for organizing this. And I think we are without delays. Also, to my audience. Just going to tell you one thing that uh, there was like few topics I was thinking first struggling with which one I should talk about. Then I thought maybe I'll share with you one of my favorite topics uh, in optimization. I have several, but I say, uh, what I'm sharing with you today is one of my favorites, especially because there's lots of uh, remaining open questions in, on this topic that some of you may be interested in thinking about. So what I have shared as the abstract and what the main structure of the talk is, I'm going to talk about something that I'm calling geometric optimization. It's a loaded word with the word geometric and have many meanings. So I'll share with you what I mean by that. And to, so that you do have a takeaway, I will spend the initial part of the talk describing roughly what I mean by geometric optimization. So in some sense, you know, at least half of my talk is motivation and background. And then I will briefly zoom through, no puns intended, uh, some recent work we have this year on a specific optimization algorithm. And that one contains some technical material, which some of you may also appreciate. So that's roughly the structure of the talk. So feel free to interrupt me. Uh, you, your organizers may help do the interruption or something because when I'm speaking, I am actually not looking at anybody's faces. Uh, it's all uh, minimized. So I may not instantly see if somebody wants to ask a question, but you know, uh, all of us, deal with this Zoom thing, so we'll figure out a way, but feel free, totally free to ask questions. Uh, and more than welcome to also, after the talk, if you have some follow-up questions, feel free to email me with those. I will eventually reply as soon as I get a chance, but, but I will reply, not necessarily right away, but I will definitely reply to any questions related to the talk anybody asks me also in follow-up email. Okay, so with that background, let's talk about first the word geometric optimization and then hopefully we get to accelerated gradient methods. So the, there are like two broad directions for context that I work on in the world of non-convex optimization. One of those is kind of non-convex optimization motivated by deep learning type of problems, which involves talking about neural network optimization, non-convex saddle point problems, etc., and going beyond stochastic gradient descent. So that's kind of, let's say, the classical view world of non-convex optimization. I care a lot for that, and that would have been the other potential topic of talking today. But instead, I'm talking today about a more limited and specialized set of non-convex optimization problems within my research. And this is a class of problems that I call geometric optimization problems where we seek often to get globally optimal solutions of non-convex problems that enjoy a special geometric structure. And anytime we have a non-convex problem, 
or a class of non-convex problems which we can efficiently reach global optima that greatly opens up our mathematical modeling repertoire and can have some surprising and interesting conclusions as we all know i'll give you some concrete examples to further spark your imagination about that so that's the class of problems i'm to talk about or be motivated by. though i will not necessarily uh, hang too much on the word global optimality for now okay the focus is more on geometry so geometry comes up in a variety of ways in optimization right so the usual setting that we have is your parameters live in some vector space so that's r to the d let's say you can endow r to the d with structure of some non vector space usually euclidean norm but other norms are also possible and that's been of course deeply studied in the theory of uh, convex optimization even within convex optimization you have beautiful geometry come up through specific sets you may be uh, optimizing over distributions so you get a probability simplex or you may be working with uh, sdb cone or you may have other special polyhedra and so on so those are all remarkable geometric structures that we care for another structure which is which comes up in some applications is that where the parameters they live on a manifold like on sphere when you're doing eigen vector problems for instance or svd type of problems or you may have manifold of low rank matrices and so on and more generally if the parameters live in some metric space for instance in the popular area of optimal transport and you may have heard the word wasserstein distance etc that's a particular kind of geometric structure where we that we give to uh, it happens to form a metric space of a probability distributions or it could be some other metric space and that's another version of geometry that is also currently quite popular and in one way or the other these geometric structures this variety of geometric structures is often motivated by applications and my motivation here was to really just go after geometry to understand a few non convex problems that were arising in my own applications so that's the direction which led me to talk about geometry and the focus for today's talk is some of the geometry coming from manifolds that is your parameters have a non linear constraint set that they have to fulfill so it's non convex set typically and this constraint set carves out a manifold so for simplicity of imagination you can think of some curved low dimensional surface and there's a reason why i talking about this it uh, leads to quite uh, beautiful mathematics and very interesting open problems even now and the humbler the simpler reason is that i used to work in some statistical estimation problems many years ago with a collaborator and for many of and for many of our problems this geometric structure of manifolds kept popping up either explicitly or implicitly and that led me to study this class more closely and what i'm going to talk today is more on the theoretical side of this class so a little kind of story behind this uh, don't take this story very seriously uh, but it's more high level story so question uh, in the beginning i said you know okay, my motivation is i'm looking for tractable class of non convex problems so tractable means okay we solvable in weekly polynomial time and minimize the cost function to epsilon accuracy to the global optimum in some time which is either log uh, log one by epsilon or okay we can tolerate even o of 1 by epsilon but it's doable and of course it turns out as everybody who does optimization knows that in general non convex problems are intractable 
and very quickly they become intractable. It's very easy to construct very simple, harmless looking non-convex optimization problems, which are harder to solve than your NP hard problems. So question is, we know that non-convex problems are intractable and we know that nature has made within the world of non-linear problems some kind of exception for convex function problems because let's say you know we have essentially unique optima so the rhetoric question here is are convex functions the only such exception nature has made for us and by the theory of slides many of you should be able to guess the answer that comes next So informally, actually, it turns out that morally speaking, indeed, these functions are the only such exception. So roughly speaking, if you have some nice set, by nice, let's say it's you know, connected and compact, etc., cetera, uh, whatever stuff we need to avoid pathologies. If you have an a nice set of function f, let's say it's a differentiable function, which satisfies the following property, that it has a unique critical point on this set, and that critical point, if it's a local optimum minimum, then it's a global minimum. So if this happens to your function, then there exists a change of coordinates, a nonlinear change of coordinates, under which, you can reparameterize your cost function to look geodesically convex. What that means is you can endow that set with a nonlinear geometry, here in particular, in fact, a Riemannian geometry. And along shortest paths on that uh, of that geometry, on that manifold, f will look convex along those paths. So informally, uh, it is morally convex if it has this local equal to global property. So that's kind of a very high level motivation. And in some sense, we, it, we shouldn't be that surprised because after all, uh, uniqueness of global optimality, local optimality, et cetera, these are topological properties kind of independent of the random nonlinear geometries we could be placing on the uh, sets, right? as long as things are kind of uh, bijective transformations, it just reshapes the functions, but it does not change the fact that your minima uh, multiply, et cetera. So long story short, this is just a high level kind of motivation that, okay, studying Riemannian geometry is a kind of a good tool for then understanding this local equal to global properties. That's kind of just the high level motivation, okay. So let's look at this important takeaway, the idea of geodesic convexity. The name reveals what it means, but if you've not seen it before, even if you tune out in the rest of my talk, this is at least one slide you should keep in mind and have as a takeaway. When you see this notion first time and say, oh yeah, I could have thought of this myself. And then you wonder why you didn't think of it if you, uh, yourself. At least this happened to me when I first ran into this concept. So look at ordinary convexity. X and Y are points in a vector space. We join them with this line here, right? And the red dot here is some point on the segment joining X to Y. So if F satisfies, I'm just writing this, you know, circle plus to mean this. So if F satisfies this inequality, we'll say F is convex. That's the usual definition of convexity. Essentially the definition. So now if instead of being joined by a straight line, the points are being are joined by some curve. And the parameter T tells you if t is equal to one, then you're at y. If t is equal to zero, then you're at x. So t is between zero and one, same as here. And red dot is point along that curve. So if that curve is like some kind of actually, it becomes important later, but for now just you know, think it's the shortest path joining two points along a curved space. Now if along that path, f satisfies 
this inequality, you get geodesic convexity. That's all. So going from a straight line to a curve. And this idea has been studied in optimization by Tamash Tapsak in 84 and around the same time, uh, not same time, sorry, 10 years later, there's also a textbook on this by Udriste. But this idea of geodesic convexity kind of dates to Karl Menger's PhD thesis in 1918 or 1919, somewhere around that time. And so this class, this kind of geodesic convex idea was discovered in mathematics already less than, you know, within two decades after metric spaces were discovered. So kind of that's history, but it's been studied a lot in math, uh, much less in optimization. But the big message here is just having this convexity structure gives us the luxury of local opt of G convex function will be global opt. And the proof is really essentially the same proof. It's just things happen to be longer curve, but the proof is just very much the same. So, so what is this and, sign, which is a circle with a plus? So what does that signify you're saying? Yes, yes. Oh, it's just to indicate, I, I just wanted to make a notation analogous to the addition mm -hmm. along a line. So along a line is actual, the circle plus just means vector addition. In the curved space, we don't have vector addition, but I'm just using this to suggest if you are at a point which is similar as if you had added those two vectors. On manifold, this will be replaced by something called an exponential map, but it's just to uh, it's just a notational shorthand to suggest a point that is one minus t away from x along that curve. So we have a curve specified somehow, a family of curves or something like that. Yeah, so we have a, a curve specified and the curve is rooted at x mm -hmm. and goes to y and a point and that curve is parameterized by t, t is between zero and one. So the curve at zero is X, the curve at one is Y, and curve at T is sort of simulating this point, which I'm denoting with a circle plus. Is there any sort of constraints on the shape of the curve or any other sort of? So this curve will be typically what will be uh, geodesic between two points. So X and Y will lie in uh, on a manifold and this curve will be the shortest path along that manifold so mm -hmm. yes that curve will be constrained and more importantly uh, if you think of it when we define convex functions uh, they are not defined in a vacuum their domain has to be a convex set so similarly when we define these convex functions that are convex along curves, they will be only useful if we are also able to define the notion of a geodesically convex set. And you can define that yourself. Suppose you're in a curved space, you take some set, you can call that set geodesically convex if for every pair of points, it also contains the shortest path joining those two points. That's another way of defining a convex set, right? And similarly on a curved space, you can do the same thing. The fact that these are geodesics and whatnot uh, becomes important when defining convexity because sometimes we want to stress this is the unique path, such path. Because when you start making curves going from X to Y, there's an infinity of way, paths you can use to join them. And to define things more properly, you sometimes need to appeal to uniqueness, et cetera, et cetera. But kind of those are very important uh, concerns that one has to work through. But at a high level, just saying, uh, you know, convexity along a line was just defined like this. And you can extend that idea to convexity along a curve, which is a cool thing. Okay. So here's a toy example to kind of bring things to you know, a very humble level is which should this concrete and humble level should also make things even clearer so for example log of one plus x i plotted this function it's you can see from the plot and of course by the calculus in your head 
it's concave in the usual sense. But it, this function is geodesically convex. If instead of joining X and Y with a line, you join them with this curve. So it's a geometric mean of X and Y. And this function satisfies this inequality along that curve. So here's an explicit formula for that curve. So the O plus actually turns into this, this thing here. So this particular, so this particular function enjoys both views, you know, along lines, it is concave, but along this, so along lines that were given by the arithmetic average, it is concave along lines that are given by or whatever, along curves that are given by the geometric average, it is convex. And this is a very simple example. The one of interest to me, like which is some less, less simple, is the following. There now the role of uh, positive numbers that we had is taken over by uh, positive definite matrices. So suppose. X and Y are two positive definite matrices. So the, let's say real symmetric and all eigenvalues are strictly positive. Then I can define this curve gamma T which joins the matrix X with the matrix Y. So I denote this with that O plus, but it, this is the formula for that curve. So if this, this curve happens to be a geodesic uh, under one of the most uh, commonly used Riemannian geometries on the set of positive definite matrices. And so if along that curve, your function satisfies this inequality, you'll get what is called a geodesically convex function. The beauty is because uh, X times Y is not Y times X for matrices. So we cannot simply use this formula that we use for log one plus X for scalars. And that makes the whole activity here much more interesting and I uh, like it because of that. So concrete example, think all matrices are PSD here. Condition number, lambda max of X divided by lambda min of X. It's not a convex function of PSD matrices. It is known to be quasi convex, but it actually turns out to be log geodesically convex along those curves. Much harder example, which people have studied in uh, LMI is the joint eigenvalue. So the, sorry, the generalized eigenvalue of a pair of PST matrices, A comma B is defined as this lambda max of A inverse B. It's known to be Euclidean quasi convex, which was kind of independently observed by Boyd and Gavi in 93. And also it's been previously studied by Nestor and Nemirovsky in 91 when developing optimization over cones, but it turns out that it not only quasi-convex, it actually is a log geodesically convex along the geodesic I showed in both variables. And trace of a power, so log of trace X to the P, P can be any real number. This function also happens to be uh, geodesically convex, even though in general it will fail to be con uh, convex or concave for arbitrary choices of P and many more. So there's many more such examples that happen to have that hidden convexity along that uh, beautiful curve. I should have kept the formula for that curve here. Sorry, I uh, don't have it here. So it turns out that for positive definite matrices, because we have such a nice closed form formula for that curve, we can actually develop a full kind of, not full, but a fairly detailed theory for recognizing and constructing, and later also optimizing geodesically convex functions. And by far one of the most useful ones of those is that the log debt, let's say B is some semi-definite matrix, AI is some complex matrix, which is not rank deficient. Mm -hmm. X is a Hermitian PSD matrix. So this map is, geodesically convex along those geodesics that I showed you. 
Mm-hmm. And that's one of the most important examples of G convex functions because it pops up in a variety of settings. For instance, you know, log det of x is barrier function minus log det of x is barrier function in interior point theory. Uh, log determinant of a covariance matrix is entropy of Gaussian, and this log det of this term comes up when studying probability theory or information theory. If you look at Bruskam Lebesgue inequalities and entropy inequalities, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. So this uh, is kind of a very fundamental function, and it happens to have this great luxury of being convex, concave in along uh, under the Euclidean view, but convex under the geometric view, which is somehow pretty. lucky circumstance i think okay. and to read uh, sorry to interrupt sure sure can you hear me so if if i am given a function um whether deciding the deciding there exists some g that makes uh, my function g convex that that is probably a hard problem right that is a very hard problem okay so in fact you are saying uh i give you you give me a function can i decide is there a choice of curves along which this will be geodesically convex so this goes back to that topology theorem that i mentioned that if on that nice set it has this property of a single critical point mm-hmm. is and that its single critical point is globally optimal mm-hmm. then we know Mm-hmm. pretty much by morse index theorem that there exists a riemannian geometry but it's an existence result but there you have to already know this extra property that local is equal to global right right if I you see. don't know that then that's why it's like uh, similar to convex functions mm-hmm. you have to do uh, the corresponding calculus to be able to either recognize or construct according right. to a few rules right right some of non negative combination of these is in the class and right. you know it's manian hessian is non is psd right. etc so those things but those are like very similar to usual convexity that you have to pay that price otherwise the question you ask however is uh, is is an is a very important question if at least for a sub class of functions we could do that right because we know from several popular machine learning examples we do have local equal to global type of functions right so what kind of uh, transformation can bring reveal the hidden convexity right and you know what yeah. like, uh, when we do convex relaxations maybe one can do g convex relaxations to problem yes indeed yeah exactly no, so th- th- these are all exactly the kind of ideas that uh, i'm hoping you know people who care about optimization will think of when you look at this concept right right because this is broadening the class of problems that were tractable mm-hmm. so this does already then also offer a class of mathematical models for offering other relaxations right and one of the places where i had thought of using it but have not used it so far is if you look at the log of the permanent of a matrix Mm-hmm. that happens to be g convex and permanent anyways is a bad function but permanent does not support does not have the convexity structure mm-hmm. uh, but it does have g convexity structure which is kind of remarkable oh, interesting but yeah i think that all of those types of uh, great applications are kind of still open right. so there's uh, really great questions that i myself have struggled with also for quite some time okay so i uh, i have a quick question please uh, yeah. so log determinant function this x should be from the family of uh, positive definite matrices yeah so th- this is like the title of the slide is only for uh, psd matrices so it's a hermitian psd matrix so this is a map on hermitian psd matrices yeah and how how do you choose the ais here so ais are usually part of your design these are complex matrices so these are just you know it's like uh, in ax equal to b x is the variable a is your observation matrix so here these ais are your some kind of observation matrices the only thing i ask is that you know ai transpose x ai mm-hmm. and when you do that summation 
should not lose rank otherwise log that of uh, rank deficient matrix will be minus infinity and okay that's kind of a useless function but other than that these ais uh, may just come from your application okay perfect thank you thank you so much so just a side remark because uh, you know once i start talking about my favorite topic i speak so much that uh, i doubt it i'll cover all the ground i wanted to but i think it's immaterial the knowing about the broad topic itself should be hopefully interesting to more of you one side remark i wanted to mention you know one by one psd matrices uh, are also scalers by people right and uh, for those matrix scalers there's a separate thing uh, better known as geometric programming is this well known tutorial that exists so that can be thought of as you know the uh, one by one matrix version of g convexity in action is just that one by one scalars are they commute with each other so all the beautiful mathematical challenges that happen with matrices they disappear so that canonical case but still it fits the same picture okay let me give you a couple of examples before also talking about some th uh, theory so just want to kind of give you some background examples uh, and some other examples uh, by examples i mean applications where i learned to appreciate geometry a bit further so i, I don't have time to share you know 10 different examples i'll just share two examples or three examples that i think in this audience will be big overlap that you have definitely in your life seen these examples if not then uh, please excuse me for sharing these examples but at least one of the three you must have seen in your life i hope so simple examples one is famous thing called gaussian mixture model you have a probability density which is given by a weighted sum of uh, multivariate gaussians and this is kind of canonical thing we also teach in ml stats type courses and canonical maximum likelihood estimation problem here says you know i have given training data x1 through xn i estimate for me the centroids and the covariance matrices and of course maybe also the pi case and the method that we teach people is this famous method called em the uh, expectation maximization algorithm you can see it's a highly cited kind of method it's uh, taught in pretty much uh, even undergrad courses or maybe it's taught taught in undergrads with that i don't remember but it's still taught everywhere so that's fine because it's a great method okay it's an alternating minimization method that often works quite well and it works particularly well for gaussian mixtures because at a very high level expectation maximization does the following doing maximum likelihood for gaussian mixture is a difficult non convex problem in its most general format it's np hard etc intractable fine so what expectation maximization does is well we have a non convex cost function that is hard to optimize whatever the word hard means there so it comes up with a lower bound we are maximizing it so we come up with a lower bound then we optimize the lower bound in the next step that's the maximization step then you come up with a better bound lower bound that's the e step and then you again optimize so that's how em works and the reason it's very nice for gaussian is that the maximization of the lower bound happens to have a simple closed form solution so you don't need an iterative solver to implement the m step so this is kind of ideal for gaussian mixtures and for long time it was believed that you can't really beat em at estimating stuff generally and i'm just skipping all the details for you except we'll tell you one thing sigma here is a positive definite matrix so my colleague and i we few years ago we thought well shouldn't we just try to solve it then using riemannian optimization by utilizing the fact that the sigmas the most difficult to compute parameter for gaussian mixture is actually lives on the pc manifold can we take this non convex problem and cast it into another non convex problem however this time 
it's cast into problem where sigmas live on geodesics rather than living in euclidean space so this is a problem that is non convex nothing becomes g, g convex here except the sub problem okay because this is a hard problem and we tried that and uh, it actually doesn't work right away one has to think more carefully but eventually uh, once you think more carefully you don't have time for those details uh, but you know once you take into account the geometry more carefully you can actually reformulate this euclidean non convex problem which em is used to solve as a riemannian non convex problem and then apply a riemannian version of gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent to it to obtain an optimization method that actually soundly outperforms em so the black line is em red line actually you can see that you know uh, yellow pink lines etc they are still a bit slower than em these are like conjugate gradient lbfgs these are solid solvers okay uh, they are they, they're still losing out but anyhow you can also do sgd and you can greatly outperform em and this actually we have very elaborate results for this because reviewers wouldn't believe us that you can beat em so soundly but uh, it turns out that uh, yes you can and once you manage to turn this once you manage to step away from em which is just a single algorithm exploit its geometry then the whole world of optimization ideas is open to you right you could say riemannian sgd you could do riemannian adam or whatever whichever is your favorite solver you know you can run its riemannian version and benefit from it so that that was uh, to me numerically a very convincing example that geometry was quite helpful and here the help did not lie in revealing hidden convexity but the help lay in computational benefits and a high level takeaway for you could be why might i want to change the geometry well for similar reasons because of which we change geometry in quasi newton methods newton methods or we do preconditioning we may improve the condition number substantially and we know that if we improve conditioning substantially numerically we'll see great speed up so in some sense you should always think of if we had the best luxury we'd like to condition our problem using a geometry where you don't lose convexity and you greatly improve condition numbers but that is too hard in general so whenever we empirically see a great benefit part of the benefit can be sent to improving the conditioning and part of it can be sent to the geometry just helps to handle non linear constraints more nicely uh can can you improve uh, the conditioning of the matrices and then apply em so i don't know what it would mean to Uh, uh, improve conditioning of the native coordinates but yes you could apply some kind of newton style transformation and try to apply em uh, potentially you could benefit from it but i'm not uh, so sure you know what conditioning you would use and if it, if the cost of computing the preconditioner outweighs the benefits of using it so this that opens a separate uh, can of worms so you may think that you know any time you have a positive definite constraint how are you going to handle it think of a variety of choices one of those is the kind of let's say the approach of interior point methods you add a barrier function and you start in the interior you remain in the interior fine the other is a psc constraint it's a non linear constraint enforcing it is not easy if you think of how to encode that non linear constraint it's a kind of challenging constraint to enforce mm -hmm. one way to do that is you can say x is equal to ll transpose okay i removed the constraint i replaced it with cholesky factorization that's the obvious thing and you can still apply euclidean methods it turns out that at least for gaussian mixture using ll transpose uh, is a terrible idea em thresh is that formulation soundly so it's not kind of a priori clear which geometry should work well this is just one particular geometry that seems to work remarkably well but i conjecture there exist other encodings of psd matrix geometry which may be equally competitive or even better 
And here the proof is only in the experiment. It's uh, not a priori clear why a particular choice should work, but once it works, then I'm saying my guess is that it helps improve the conditioning and that's why it works. Thank you. So here's another one. Here is a conceptual one. So I have always been interested in eigenvalue problems. So one of the canonical ones being uh, principal components analysis. So you imagine you have N observations. Those are the ZIs and you want the principal component. So what is that? So you form the covariance matrix. Let's say everything is centered at zero. So you have a covariance matrix, sigma I, ZI, ZI transpose. You want its largest eigenvector. PC is doing that for you, right? Uh, what I'm talking here is, okay, the same thing, largest eigenvector problem, but I want to go one step further. Let's say the number of observations N is really big. So I actually want to uh, think about doing this for large data sets. So I don't want to just think in terms of eigenvectors of ZI, ZI transpose, but I want to actually uh, benefit from this N. So I'm actually thinking in terms of using a stochastic type of method. So in any case, the eigenvector problem can be written in this format, right? We can write it as an optimization problem. And optimization problem has a constraint, this nonlinear constraint. That nonlinear constraint is that the vector X lives on a sphere. So this is nothing but a Euclid, sorry, this is nothing but a Riemannian optimization problem where the underlying manifold is a sphere. And many people have studied from like, this became popular again in machine learning community in 2015. I haven't uh, kept track of the literature ever since, but last time when I wrote down this slide, you know, that was the update. There's lots of work on applying SDD or SVRG or accelerated SGD, et cetera, et cetera, to this non-convex problem. And because we know eigenvector computation is tractable, even though this problem is non-convex, being able to say how quickly will SGD give you the answer or an, an answer. And the analysis becomes somewhat more complicated because it's non-convex. So a very remarkable thing happens here, which got me excited. Even though the problem is non-convex in the Euclidean sense, spheres do not really admit convexity structures. So it's actually also non-convex geodesically. However, we found that this optimization problem, it satisfies some kind of geodesic convexity-like structure. So it satisfies for those who know the PL inequality, which is the Polyakoyasi inequality, but on a, in a Riemannian sense. And anytime your cost function satisfies that type of inequality, then SGD, SVRG gradient descent will converge at a linear rate to the global optimum. So in particular, by just observing that this problem satisfies a convexity-like property, but on the sphere, you could bypass 20 pages of uh, analysis by just you know half a page of analysis showing that, okay, then Riemannian version of SGD, which is nothing but uh, essentially stochastic power iteration, will converge at linear rate to the correct answer. I have a question actually about this. Yeah. So how does this compare to the results that say things like all global, all local optima are global optima as long as you change the, you know, change the optimization a little bit? You know, so there's this work by Tengyu Ma and, and others. So I don't know what you mean by all local optima are global because- we So you change the, that... they change the optimization, they change the program that they're trying to solve. They add a regularizer, regularizer or something like that. And then what happens is it in, in, in nice, nice problems, nice problems. Uh, it, it ends up being that the, all, all the, you find a local minimum, you add a global minimum because there's some uncertainty about um, uh, which global minimum you end up at. I think th there are a few concerns being mixed up there. So suppose you had a non-convex function mm -hmm. who 
that is uh, whose hessian eigen values are between minus l and plus l okay. so now to this non convex function if you add l times a quadratic square yeah this one will be globally convex and somehow game is over and up to a factor of l now you can start making lots of i things. see okay so, but that doesn't quite help us in the sense that you are changing the problem what right. i'm saying is i'm still getting you eigen vectors and i'm still running stochastic power iteration the other papers are also running only the mathematical analysis is not a euclidean analysis the mathematical analysis says that this original problem of yours it may be non convex but it satisfies a riemannian convexity like property which explains why power iteration succeeds okay thank the you very much the ways of explaining in linear algebra why power iteration succeeds this is explaining stochastic power iteration succeeds thanks to that hidden riemannian like convexity so it's not changing the problem okay thank you very much and here also i'd say maybe we got lucky that this beautiful property holds you know uh, but eigen vectors is a place to get lucky because it's one of those non convex problems that uh, nature still favors us and i guess i've spoken too much uh, i mean i've spoken many words but maybe not that much substance i'm running out of time so let me skip the wasserstein optimal transport example and actually tell you at least share with you some one or two cool theoretical results and questions at least this there's some insights here that you may like so okay those are those those examples and i have like 10 more examples because i have worked on several applications where somehow this geometry was helpful and once you you know do enough of those applications and it seems to be numerically helpful then you wonder what can we as theory people say about that and so we know the kind of theory that i'm now looking at here is we have a rich developed theory of first order optimization for convex optimization or for let's say euclidean optimization where we assume things like convexity or maybe not convexity but lipschitz functions or strong convexity or smooth functions etc cetera, etc cetera. we assume those in the euclidean case and then we prove theorems about what we can do and similar thing we can do with our geodesically convex functions which are defined along manifolds that all these concepts rather than holding along lines now they get to hold along curves and we can do this high very high level for those of you who are not familiar you know when building algorithms gradient descent first order style methods we often have to add vectors point x gets taken to x plus v addition is simulated by something called an exponential map at the point x it's a curved space you make a tangent plane the vector v lies in the tangent plane it tells you which direction to move in you move there and then you can pull it back onto the curved surface by you can call it a projection i don't like to call it a projection just a retraction onto the manifold it's called an exponential map which simulates for you addition and it has its inverse also Uh, under suitable assumptions this mapping has an inverse that's called the inverse exponential map you can use that to kind of simulate subtraction and using this the beauty of course of differential geometry is mathematicians have worked for you know 100 plus years 150 years to construct in great detail concepts like lens angles differentiation you know translation flows gradient flows what not into these spaces you can benefit from all of that anyhow so question the kind of question we are interested in asking here is okay we have now an optimization problem we want to minimize f of x where x lies in some let's say compact set which is a subset of a manifold this is the standard setup if the manifold is this r to the d this is your euclidean optimization problem right and now for building first order optimization we make this assumption that we have access to an oracle that can compute for us exact or inexact stochastic gradients so you assume that oracle then you can study gradient descent which is x minus eta times gradient translated using this picture from the last slide its analog on manifolds is this object lives in the tangent space 
this is the Riemannian gradient. And you can bring the stuff back to retract it onto the manifold by using exponential maps. So gradient descent gets replaced by this. So this one, this type of translation you can just do purely by syntax change without no differential geometry. So you, that's a good thing. That's how I got interested in this area is that, you know, to start doing stuff with uh, this topic, to use it and to build algorithms and to implement them, you don't really need to know any differential geometry. You need to know a little bit when it comes to debugging software so that you know why something went wrong. But to start out, you don't need much. So this is the Riemannian analog of gradient descent. So now we know, you know, for Euclidean case, there's a theory of first order optimization for gradient, stochastic, coordinate, accelerated, fast, da, 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 da. starting from, of course, seminal work of Nemirovsky Udin, but there's lots of work in that area, right? So our question is okay, we are assuming now geodesic convexity. So global optimality should be possible to talk about. Uh, how can we guarantee that your algorithms iterates are close to the optimum? And how much time does it take? And this is actually a very interesting task, which originally we started looking at it only in 2016. So it is kind of recent. And the starting point was this. This is, I think, a, a very simple picture, but this slide and the next slide has an important takeaway. So if you had to tune out, this is the, your chance to tune back in. This has some useful takeaway for optimization people. So. In the Euclidean case, your high school trigonometry, so-called Euclidean law of cosines is essential, turns up to be essential in analyzing the progress of your Euclidean method. Here's why. So let's say for simplicity, this is your gradient descent style iteration. G is like stochastic, whatever, not usual gradient, right? So what we do is you started at X zero, you moved along some lines, you reach xt and you say, okay, xt is at some distance to x star. And from xt, you go to xt plus one. And then you say, okay, now we have this triangle between xt, xt plus one and x star. We knew that the distance of xt to x star was b. Distance between xt and xt plus one is c. Hence the distance xt plus one and x star, the distance a can be controlled in terms of b and c and the angle. And that's where you use your trigonometry, right? So in particular, that's the law, right? A squared is B squared plus C squared minus two times BC cosine A, which is nothing but you expand XT plus one minus X star square in this format. That's exactly your uh, trigonometry in action. And well, good and bad, that's often a starting point or a subroutine in many of our analyses. But in curved space, we already fail there. We don't have these triangles there. We don't have such a law of Euclidean trigonometry there. You have some other complicated distance function along curves. So we fail at the very first step. And so what we did after reducing it to this triangle, understanding this triangle, we try to see, okay, if, even if we don't have this law, does there exist some approximate version of it or some replacement for it? That's the kind of natural question to ask. So we say that in particular in curved space, a triangle looks like this. So I'm looking at a very particular type of curved space where triangles look thin. So the sum of interior angles is less than 180 degrees. So the triangles look thin. We are in this curved space. How do I relate the sides? And it turns out there is a hyperbolic law of cosines, but it's not quite in the format that we want. So we can't really use it. So there's a bunch of tools that I'm gonna skip for now that go into saying that actually the Euclidean triangle law equality we can replace with this inequality where this distance a square is less than or equal to b square plus something times c square and the rest is the same. So now there's 
no longer equality, there's a distortion which comes because space is curved and this distortion coefficient is bigger than or equal to one. And it depends on how curved your space is. So kappa min is a negative number here. Let's say the space is negatively curved. And we assume that we are in a space where that curvature is lower bounding. So you take its absolute value. So it's basically something divided by 10 H of something. That's the bound. And as this curvature goes to zero, this quantity goes to one. And even though we lost equality, the inequality holds in the right direction and you get the Euclidean case back as you should. Otherwise you pay some price of curvature. So this is a very important tool that you could use to extend a bunch of Euclidean thinking. So the hard work lies in proving this inequality. And part of it, it turns out, we ended up rediscovering this proof. Uh, we find, discovered a simpler version of this in some math literature at some point. But anyhow, once you have this, then you can get analogs of first order results also in curved land, where now things slow down by a factor that depends on the curvature. And so the cool thing is you do have a first order upper complexity bound theory for geodesically convex functions. Uh, this is a code 2016 paper. The fully open part is a lower bound theory where in particular you want the lower bounds to be sensitive to curvature because Euclidean lower bounds already apply as lower bounds to the Riemannian case, but lower bounds sensitive to curvature are completely open. I'm you know, not a pessimistic person, so I don't study lower bounds, but somebody who cares about lower bounds may someday develop those you know, in case you are interested. I mean, you may be an optimistic person and still prove pessimistic things, it depends on your mood. So anyway, this is like you, you know, background, but since then this stuff has been extended in many directions, but I'm kind of out of time to actually tell you uh, yeah, I got carried away, sorry about that. To actually tell you about, uh, I'll just mention one sentence here and then I'll show you the last slide. Skip the meat in between. So I had made that broad over claim that you take the Euclidean iterations, do pattern matching to replace them with the Riemannian versions. The method should work out. And maybe after you use this geometric tool that I showed you and a couple of other geometric tools we developed, analysis should also work out. And then at some point we wondered, okay, the other challenge is fa famous and important method in Euclidean cases, Nesterov's accelerated gradient method. What about an accelerated gradient method in curved space? And my initial thought when I was very naive was you do exactly this pattern matching and some more hard work it'll work out, but it did not. And it took, for a few years we struggled to make it work out. It turns out to be very tricky. Finally, after uh, struggling for quite some time, uh, earlier this year in Colt, we had a paper which finally discovers a way to do accelerated gradient optimization on manifolds. And uh, unfortunately, I can only advertise that now and skip through this, but I'm still going through all the slides. The video is recorded. So, you know, in, any, in, in case anybody really wants to dive into that, you're welcome to. But we had to kind of reinvent the Euclidean analysis of Nastrov's method so that we could generalize it because the existing analysis that exist for acceleration, none of them we could generalize to our case. So we had to redo the Euclidean case from scratch, which was the most crucial thing. And then somehow worry about curvature, I'll have to skip that and really get to the punchline. Leave here with me because it's already three o'clock. Don't want to hold you too long. I actually originally thought I'll go through everything, but then I thought, you know. Okay, so punchline was yes, uh, acceleration exists and we could finally show that in the Riemannian case. And after that, uh, 
just a summary of what the whole talk was about. I only got through the first half where non-convex optimization offers you know, a complexity of challenges and geometry can be a powerful idea in there, useful one as for practitioners uh, and of course for those who enjoy theory. And then I focused a little bit on the important concept of geodesic convexity, which includes all of Euclidean convexity as a special case. So it's a strict superset. And I talked a little bit about complexity theory of the first order G convex optimization and showed how also curvature slows down convergence. And then I just zoomed through, you know, the Riemannian accelerated gradient. And there's a, so many open problems here because this kind of complexity theory of optimization in curved spaces is just a few years old, starting from our paper. So there's only, you have only scratched the surface. There's so much more to do. And I welcome you, you know, to think about it if you find geometry interesting. So with that, I will conclude my talk. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Sovret. We'll, we'll uh, uh, end with a uh, round you. of applause. Uh, so, um, Mert, you want to take over? Or I, I guess, I guess uh, we ha maybe have time for one or two quick questions. We are out of time. So, I may have a quick question. Yeah. Uh, so, for acceleration, you know, you go from kappa to skirt of kappa, usually. Yeah. So in the remaining case, um, what would be the analog of these things? Uh, so same thing. So what we said, let's look at the simplest case. So you define a uh, Riemannian version of L smooth function. Mm -hmm. And you define the Riemannian version of mu strongly geodesically convex function. Okay. Then kappa is the same. I see. And there will be some other factor dependent on curvature, but that's a separate of the manifold because mm -hmm. there are now two notions of curvature, right? The kappa in acceleration is curvature of the cost function. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we also have curvature of the manifold. So the challenge was actually to do something with the curvature of the cost function and not get completely ruined by curvature of the manifold. Okay. And at a high level, now that means after I looked at it for a few years, I realized uh, Nestor's method by itself, mm -hmm. uh, I used to view it as, you know, implicitly being a primal dual type of method. Mm -hmm. And so basically Euclidean duality and such things, they all go through hyperplanes mm -hmm. uh, as do Euclidean subgradients, etc. But we don't have the notion of hyperplanes here on a manifold, which is what proved to be a big barrier mm -hmm. that we had to overcome. I see, I see. Okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Well, I'm then going to abuse my role as, as uh, the co-host and ask the question, uh, for perhaps the last one, because we are out of time, which is that how, how do we do, like, is there is the requirement that you have to basically for every problem still first verify that local optimum equal to global optimum condition before you can try to apply this machinery? And, and I guess that will have to be then done on a case by case basis or did I miss something very basic about that? No, I mean, well, there are two things, right? When you say for every problem, problems are mathematical models designed by us. So you choose to design whether you endow your model with this geometry or not. Second, if you're taking an existing model, like eigenvectors, then you have to see if it satisfies something, some additional geometric properties that people may have missed. Like for eigenvectors, I mentioned that, you know, uh, even though eigenvectors have been studied for so long, that they have this implicit convexity like property on manifolds was not was missed. And if you recognize that, then suddenly many things become transparent. Or let's say if you work with existing model like low rank structure, which is kind of a popular structure that people have worked with, then we know that, okay, a set of rank K matrices forms a manifold. So you could try to exploit that. 
uh, it may or may not benefit you. So I am a strong believer in first running it on my computer before doing any theory to see if, it, if, it, if this geometry is beneficial. Because a priori, it may or may not be beneficial because, you know, just because it can improve the conditioning in some problems, maybe in some other problems, the nonlinear transformation can hurt the conditioning. Who knows, right? So for some problems, I can actually explicitly compute the condition numbers and show you that in the Euclidean case, the condition number is exponentially higher than in the Riemannian case for very specific problems. But in general, you can't make such a statement, right? We can't even make such a statement in general for when will Newton method succeed, for instance. Thank you so much. That, that's actually a wonderful point for theory student researchers, which is that, uh, you know, it, it, the value of trying it out beats any other thing because you then know you're not the, going in the wrong, wrong direction. The only reason I rediscovered the notion of gene convexity was I had worked on several applications where somehow magically, no matter how we were initializing, always same solution was being found by MATLAB. And somehow the solvers were always very robust, no matter what we were doing. And so we said, okay, somehow maybe the solution is always unique. Then why is that? So after having run into such an example in some stats and computer vision applications over the years, then kind of, kind of finally through a convoluted path hit upon maybe geodesic convexity is the explanation which it was. So yeah. I, I believe in practice first and theory later. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. Uh, let, let's thank Sovret one more time. Uh, and with this, we'll conclude our seminar. We'll have our next seminar after a week's break on November 4th. See you all then.